Well, let's talk about a guy named Jonah. You know him? Uh, he was a fisherman. <laughs> he just did reverse fishing where he was caught. But I, I want to talk to you about this, this guy named Jonah. If you've grown up in church, you, you've heard the story. It seems kind of weird that a dude can, can be swallowed up by a big fish and, and living in the fish for a few days uh, before finally being spit out. And we're not going to talk about all the, the fish, the well, the whatever it was that was in the sea that got him. Um, but what I do want to tell you is, is show you a little bit about the calling on his life. And today, I want to talk to you on the subject of running from your life, running from your life. Um, the overall theme in the book of Jonah is about this prophet. Jonah's a prophet. Um, God gave him a call and said, hey, this is what I'm putting on your life. This is what I want you to do with your life. Jonah said, no, thank you. I don't want that. And, and so he, he had a calling for a people that he didn't love, and he did not like the outcome of what was going to happen. Um, so he basically was given this assignment from God and said, I, I don't want that. I don't, that's not going to fit what I want. It's not going to fit what I need. And so Jonah rejects God's call. He's, he's, God tells him, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to go preach to the Ninevites. I want you to go tell them about who I am. And he says, absolutely no way. No way. And here's what happens. Jonah's going to find himself in a sea of regret when he turns down this calling. Now, let's talk about what the Bible means by the word calling, because a lot of times I hear it in the, in the circles of Christianity, especially in the church, that everybody wants to throw around the term calling. I feel called to do this, and I feel called to do that. I, I feel called to take the trash out. No, that's, that's, your, that's your job. That's what you do. Like, we take the trash out. And so what happens is, in, in a lot of churches, people will just throw that word calling on it to spiritualize it, to make it sound better than it is. Oh, well, God's called me to serve my church. It's a calling. It's a personal calling. He's given. No, he's not. He's given everybody that general calling that we are to serve the body with a serve. And so this, this has been thrown out in these evangel, uh, evangelical circles, and I think that the word has lost its meaning. So I, I want to take a moment to try to recapture what this word calling is so we understand moving forward where Jonah is. And so every Christian is called by God for a specific purpose, okay? Every one of us. Now you may say, uh-oh, I don't know what that is. Well, we can help you with that, but every Christian is called to a specific person. And only God can put those callings in the lives of people. Pastors can't do it. Your closest friends can't give you the calling. Only God can give you the calling on your life. A calling is something that God places within you, right? He says in Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes, says it is God. It is God who does what? Who works in who? You. Y'all have no confidence in that. It is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. God has a calling on your life. He's got a purpose for your life. He's got something that he has designed you to do, right? And, and what happens is there are two types of callings. There's a general calling that we all have, which is it's a call to have a relationship with Jesus, to respond to the gospel, to have a relationship, to surrender to his lordship. So that's everybody. But then we have specific callings that God has called us to do things specifically. Every one of, the, every one of us in here is going to look different. For some of us, it's going to be full-time ministry. For some of you, it's going to be medical work, real estate, stay-at-home moms, stay-at-home dads, <laughs> military service. Some people, it's what it is. Or anything else that God specifically called you to do to glorify Him. So whatever you do in your daily life, and you're, you're using your giftings in the, in the education realm, or in landscaping, or real estate, or medical, whatever that is, how do you use those giftings to bring glory to God? That is a specific calling. I remember in high school that I felt I was meeting with my pastor and we were talking through some things because I was, I was struggling with, with some internal, not knowing what the direction was for my life. And, um, and, and as I was trying to discover what it is, like, what is my purpose after high school? Like, I just knew I lived in Dillon County. Um, I tell people the best part of Dillon is the rearview mirror. And I wanted to get out of town, and I wanted to go do something else, but I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what the calling was. There were so many directions. And as I talked to him, we began to discover, and through prayer and, and hearing from God, I discovered that he was calling me to full-time ministry. And he affirmed that calling through other people. Other people began saying, hey, I, I really feel like this is what maybe God has, has done, is doing through you, and what God wants to do. 
through you. And, and that, that, didn't, that didn't sit well with me. Like I, full-time ministry and working in a church was not the thing that I ever wanted to do. It was actually the opposite of what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't like the idea of working in church because it seemed boring to me. Um, I don't like wearing suits. If I wear a suit, it's probably because I'm at your funeral. Uh, I don't like ties. I don't like those things being around my neck. Um, I didn't like deacon meetings. Anybody ever sat through one of those? Uh, I call them demon meetings. And, and I, I felt like Chick-fil-A. I didn't want to work on Sundays. Like I just, Sunday was not the thing for me. So what did I do? I tried to run from that call. I sat out and said, that's cool. But that's not me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pursue what I want to pursue. And so I started on the track. I wanted to become a flight medic and ultimately a rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard. I know you're looking at me going, man, you, your body, you just would that would have been a great choice. But I'm buoyant. I will float. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to leave. I know what God called here, but I knew what, what drew me. And so I began pursuing going to EMT school, getting all that stuff done, meeting with a Coast Guard recruiter. It was all good until God stopped me in my tracks. And he wouldn't let me move any further. And he kept reminding me and haunting me with this. I've, I've called you to something greater. You can go chase this or you can follow me. Because chasing you will get worn out. Following me will walk at your pace. Like, we'll, I'll take you where you need to go. And so I, I remember having this conversation with God of the more I pursued, the more miserable I got. And so I started to surrender to him of what he was calling me to do, because I knew in my life I was blatantly ignoring the calling that God had given me. And after a year chasing my desires and running from God's call, I finally surrendered and I made a few side deals with God. You ever done that? Yeah, we're really good at the side deals. So God, here's my contract, but here is my non-negotiables. I'll pursue ministry on these terms. I will never attend North Greenville University. I will never be a senior pastor and I will never be involved or plant a church. Now, those side deals did not work out because that fall I enrolled in North Greenville University. I did four years of college and five. I'm not, some of y'all aren't good in math, so you won't get that. <laughs> now I'm a senior pastor, and we planted a church. Um, it's not that God didn't hear my side deals. It just wasn't a part of his plan. He knew better than I did. And it was, the, it was a moment of surrender. And this is like Jonah. Jonah is running from the call that God had given him. He's chasing other things instead of following. And again, it's a lot easier to follow than it is to chase. And so Jonah's running from the calling that God gives him. If you look at his story in, in Jonah chapter 1, he says this. Now, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. And call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee from Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarsus. So he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go, to, go with them to Tarshish, and away from the presence of the Lord. Did y'all catch that last part? He paid to go away from the presence of the Lord. Now, the question is, how bad is Nineveh that Jonah, Jonah would spend money for a fare on a boat to get as far away from the place as he possibly could? Nineveh is a really big, flourishing city at this time. It's filled with lots of evil. Nineveh is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. It's not mentioned again in Scripture until the days of Jonah. And this is the place that Jonah is being called. And the idea of going to Nineveh kind of repulses Jonah because due to its, its great hatred, they, the Israelites can't stand the Assyrians. Y'all have heard those people before through our Bible readings. They can't stand the Assyrians. And now God is telling Jonah, I want you to go minister to the people that you can't stand. No, I'm good. I'll go the other way. Like, let them get what they get, right? Um, it reminds me, my wife is a, is a K, well, she's a librarian now, but she was a K-5 teacher this, this past year. And one of the little kids, uh, they, they were just taking up prayer requests. You know, in a K-5 class, prayer requests get really gets a little, a little sketch, right? Um, and, and just, they, they're very direct when they pray. They, they want specific things when they pray. Like, God, I pray that God tells my mommy and daddy to let me have extra playtime today, that I want to have my Kindle today. And one little kid this past week, 
uh, they were fixing to pray, and he shot his hand up and said, I, I got a prayer request. I want to pray for Satan. They're like, oh, okay. We probably should. This is where you don't do open mic. Well, what do you want to pray for Satan? I, I just think we should pray for Satan that he has a good day in hell. <laughs> so very specifically, um, I, don't, I don't know what to do with that. But praying so specifically, if we see that pop up on our prayer request, we, we're going to have to figure that out. But, uh, you know, just I asked, I asked Allison, what do you do? She's like, I just pray for him to have a good day in hell. I don't, what do you do? Like, so, um, yeah, if you've not served in our kids' ministry, by the way, you get opportunities like that all the time. Also, serving in our kids' ministry, you learn secrets about things that you don't know about yet, like who's pregnant and who's not. That, they'll tell you in a heartbeat. Um, anyway. But being so specific, and, and Jonah, Jonah is here going, I, I, don't, I don't want this. I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to these people. I don't like these people. I want to go somewhere else. There's a hatred. They, the, the Ninevites are known as some of the cruelest people in all of the ancient world. In their history, they boast about how cruel they actually were. They would skin people alive. They would spread out their skins over the city walls as wallpaper. Anybody? Okay, I don't see that, Chip and Joanna. You ain't doing that yet. And then they would bury people that they had skinned while they were still alive up to their heads in the sand, and they would pull their tongues out and drive a straight a stake through the tongue into the ground so that they would have to have pain and die of thirst. And then at night, they would make them listen to Luke Bryan's music over and over again. <laughs> I made that last part up, but that would be brutal. But it was so bad. It was so bad that this is who you want me to go? Like, number one, I'm putting my life at risk. They do not like me as an Israelite. So that's, that's problem number one. But number two, they don't deserve your grace. They don't deserve your mercy. You ever said that about somebody before? They don't deserve it. And Jonah's fighting. And these were the people that Jonah's been asked to go and preach to. Nineveh was one of the primary targets, one of its primary targets was just south, a neighbor to the south called Israel. And Jonah knew that these people had targeted some of his very own family members, his friends, people that he knew, but God's asking him to go. So naturally, like you and me, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that I want to do this. And in chapter 3, Jonah says the reason why he doesn't want to go preach to Nineveh. He says because, listen, Jonah said, I don't want to go preach to them because he was afraid, you ready, that they would repent and be forgiven. Because I, I would rather them go to hell. I'd rather them go to hell and have a good day with Satan than, than do this. That, that was the, think about it. I would rather them go to hell than me go and preach to them and be forgiven. My, the reason I don't want to go, God, because I don't want them to repent. I don't want them to know who you are. I don't want them to be forgiven. So Jonah had a, there's a little bit of bitterness. Wouldn't you, do you sense the bitterness here with Jonah? He's got bitterness towards these people, but despite their reputation as this, this renegade city, God still considers these people, the Ninevites, worthy of the gospel message. He still has hope for them. He still wants to love them. He still wants to offer them forgiveness, but he needs the servant, the prophet, to go and preach and proclaim the good news of God. But Jonah's going to rebel. And instead of obediently listening to God and doing the commands of God, this rebellious prophet ends up paying a very costly price for walking away from the very thing that God's called him to. So he pays to board this ship. He's hoping to suppress the calling through distance because sometimes we think that if we'll run far enough that we can outrun where God is and we won't have to deal with it anymore. And then he was literally trying to turn and go the other way. And for him, Tarshish was as far as he could go. And here begins Jonah's rebellion against God because what happens, Tarshish is 1,500 miles away from Nineveh. And he, I don't think he paid like a small ticket price for that. I think he paid all out full cruise line prices to get away. The book of 2 Kings in chapter 14 tells us that Jonah was one of Israel's number one prophets. Not very number one, Right? When you're going the other way, he was successful in ministry during one of Israel's finest hours. One thing that we learn here from Jonah is you will never feel farther from God than when you're close to him and you say no. 
You'll never, you're close to him and he calls you and you say no. You will feel distant. By the way, God's not the one that moves in that scenario when we say no. And so while Jonah may have been one of the biggest prophets, right now he's been a rebellious prophet. And he, he heads to Joppa to find a ship that is ready to set sail, and he finds a ship. And if you want to run from God, there will always be a ship ready to sail. You will always find a way out. You have an enemy whose role is to ready the ship for your disobedience. Satan will get your boat ready. He will get you a deck chair. He will put it out on the deck. He'll get you a little drink with an umbrella. He'll get you everything you need to be comfortable as long as you're going the opposite way of where God wants you to go. And some of us are just sitting on deck chairs, just watching the waves and enjoying, not realizing that we are heading the opposite direction of where God wants. Just because there's a ship that's ready to sail, it doesn't mean it's your ship to sail on. Sometimes you've got to let the ship go, and sometimes you've got to burn the ship. You got to let it out. And sometimes what happens is we try to excuse our disobedience. We'll use phrases like, Well, I had a peace in my heart about this. If I'm not mistaken, Jesus said, Don't trust your heart because it's bad. Well, I just felt in my gut. Well, there's not good things that happen in your gut. I don't want to make a decision based off my gut, and I don't want to make a decision based off of my broken heart. I want to make a decision off of what God tells me. But sometimes we were like, I just, I just feel like we need to go with the flow. And this, we just, it just feels so much peace about this. And then 90% of the time we get in the situation and make the decision and it's everything but peaceful. Your emotions will lie to you. Your emotions will lie to you. This is why we buy things to be happy and then we don't use them anymore. and We end up in storage units. Have y'all noticed the amount of storage units that we have in our community? Because we buy things to store things that made us happy for a small season. And they brought no joy. We cannot go off of our emotion. We can't base things off our emotion. We have to base it off of what God tells us to do. And one of Satan's primary goals is to give you a piece about something that's completely wrong. In high school, you had the boyfriend, girlfriend that you were convinced you had so much peace, you were going to marry them. How'd that work out? But some of you, I know, we get it. You're the special, you, had, you married your high school sweetheart. I get it. I went to Dillon High School. There was no, my wife's from Columbia. She moved to Dillon. Thank you, Jesus. Because she wanted to go the opposite direction when her family, her parents said, we're leaving Columbia to go to Dillon. Right? No. <laughs> but thank you, Jesus, because I was the Ninevite on the other end of that. But Satan wants to give you peace about doing the wrong thing. If you think about it in Genesis chapter 3, the first temptation he assured the woman when she was, going to eat, she was about to bite into the fruit was, oh, it's okay. And she just felt like it was right. It was the right thing to do. But it only took one bite. It only took one bite into the temptation, and now we're all paying the price for it. And that's really all it takes. It just, it just takes one for us to get off of the path, the, the peace that we have in our heart may not be God's affirmation for what we're doing. It may be Satan numbering your conscience. He leads you down a path that makes you feel better and better and better. Don't look to peace in your heart as a guide in your life, but look to God's word because that's where he says, my words are lamp into my feet and a light to your path. But a lot of times when, when we're trying to make decisions, we will often go to people before we ever go to God that will often start talking to everybody else without talking to God about what you need. And I'm not talking like big decisions. I'm talking about every decision that we make. What does God want us to do? What, what does it look like for me to hear from him and to be obedient and live out my life based off his word instead of off of my emotions or off of my opinion? Because peace in our hearts can change, but God's word will never, ever, ever change. So in disobedience, Jonah sets sail. And the things that feel peaceful, because it was peaceful getting the ticket, it was peaceful. I don't know if you've ever seen the Mediterranean Ocean. It's beautiful. It's a nice little cruise. And then it turns disastrous really quickly for him. And he begins getting this regret. Look at verse 4. It says, but the Lord, Lord threw a great wind upon the sea, and there was a, a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Can you say bad day? 
And then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they started throwing cargo that was in the ship. they throwing it into the sea. Hopefully they could lighten the load a little bit. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and he laid down, and he went to sleep. Everybody else is on deck, fearing for their lives, calling out to whatever God they worship. And the whole problem, the reason they're going through this mess anyway, is because there's a guy asleep in the bottom of the boat who's, who God's after. And he sends a storm. Sometimes your disobedience, by the way, will affect other people. It will affect other people. The problem for Jonah, the problem with running from God, is that God is already where you're going. If he's omnipresent, he's already there. So you can try to run from him, and when you get to where you're going, he's going to be standing there. Hey, how you doing? How was your boat ride? Not good, huh? Jonah thought by distancing, if I just distance myself from the calling, I'm going to be in the clear. Everything will be good. I won't have to worry about anything else. Yet he didn't realize that God was already where he was running to. God was right in the middle of the sea, right in the middle of the storm that they came up against. And the storm comes up, and these pagan sailors on board, listen, they begin fearing for their lives. That they're just throwing up all the prayers to their gods. And the Bible tells us as they begin praying to their gods in hopes that they would be protected. Now, how ironic is it that they're up there having a theological discussion and the prophet of God who has the answer is down below asleep? I find it interesting because there's a play on words that's happening here in the Hebrew. The play on words, you should see this when it says, if you see that word down, y'all have seen that pop up a few times here? So that word down is being repeated. And the word sleep in Hebrew is a word used for deep sleep, as when Adam went into a deep sleep, not dozing off, not your Sunday afternoon nap. I'm talking about you're out of it. You ever wake up, you got the slobber out of your mouth, and you feel like, man, that's where, what time is it? It was deep sleep. That's where he's at. And if you look at this, Jonah goes down to Joppa, down to the inner part of the ship, and down into a sleep. It's a sleep of death. This is a total spiritual disaster that's happening. So when you look at this, what you're doing is getting a picture of the downward progression of sin. And he keeps going, progressing the wrong way. Sin always starts with disobedience, and it will end up in total spiritual disaster. Can anybody testify to that? Like, we have messed our lives up with sin by taking a bite of the wrong fruits. So look in verse 6. It says, So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God, perhaps the God that will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, these guys are calling out to false gods, but God's kind of given some insight. Sometimes God will give some insight to people. And he tells them, uh, they cast lots, and God's like, oh, let me roll that dice one more time. Oh, look, it fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us on whose account the evil has come upon. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country? He's been interrogated. And, and, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Pretty bold. You fear him, but yet you're running from him. Sometimes we'll just say stuff. We'll super spiritual language to cover ourselves. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? Jonah's like, whoa. For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them that. What God did they worship? Not that God. But yet there was a fear. And for Jonah, it didn't go well for him. In the midst of this storm, Jonah's fast asleep He's hiding in the belly of the boat, and, and when his part in the storm is revealed through the casting of lots, Jonah finally admits his true identity, and he finally admits out of his mouth what his calling is. And then Jonah offers his life as a substitute for the safety of the crew. Let me just give myself. And this is the redemptive nature of the narrative begins to emerge here, because though he was reluctant, Jonah begins to proclaim the true nature, power, and the intentions of God. Look at verse 11. They said to him, what shall we do to you? that the sea may quiet down for us. For the sea grew more and more temptuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard 
to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more against them. And therefore they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Now, now who are they praying to? Because that word Lord is in capital. They, they have quickly gone from praying to their pagan gods to praying to the God. And they're asking now to let us not perish and let us uh, and, and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O oh Lord, have done as it is pleased to you. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the boat, uh, into the sea. <laughs> he wishes he would have been thrown in the boat. And the sea ceased from its raging, and the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. They throw him overboard. They watch him float away. And the sea calms, and the first thing they do is worship. Do you remember another story where the sea was rough, and Jesus is sleeping in the bottom of the boat, and he comes up and calms the sea, and what's the first thing the disciples do? Worship. Worship. This is a foreshadowing, by the way. There's a lot more in that, but we don't have the three hours to discuss. With no other options, these sailors throw him overboard. And even in the midst of rebellion, Jonah can't help but be used by God to bring the message of salvation. Because here's what happens. This storm was terrifying. This storm was costly. But it's an act of God's grace. Sometimes God will send the storm into your life and allow it to happen to disrupt the path that you're on to get you back where you need to be. Y'all ever been through one of those? He will allow it to happen. He Ask Job. Job lost everything. God allowed it to happen to get him where he needed to be. So the only way that we're going to survive the storm is by submitting to God, by hearing from, from him, by knowing his word. If Jonah had continued to fight the storm, it would have killed him, and it would have killed everybody on board. Everybody would have died. Here's the thing about Jonah. He's going to end up in the belly of a fish for a few days. It's going to take him to the, the shores of Nineveh, and it's going to spit him out. And he, he's going to finally answer the call, but it's going to be with, I'm not really excited about this call. And he's going to go to Nineveh, and he's going to pout. And he's going to whine for a few days. And finally, he's going to listen to God. He's going to go into Nineveh. He's going to give them the message that God's going to destroy them. And guess what happens when he does it? In chapter 3, chapter 4, they repent. We were wrong. The king, the Bible says the king takes his crown and his robe off and he puts on burlap and he gets into the ashes. This is symbolic of surrender. And the, and the whole group, the Ninevites, repent and come to know God. And we would be celebrating. If we went in to some of our community that, that was so evil, and we went in and gave them the message that God had delivered, and, and no matter what they had done, had given their lives to Christ and surrendered their lives to Jesus, we would be celebrating, wouldn't we? Not Jonah. Jonah complained. Jonah whined. Jonah cried. Jonah went out and said, I'm going to sit underneath this tree, and I'm just going to sit here and wait for God. And God begins having a conversation with Jonah. And he provides, let me read this to you, because I think this is the most important piece here. That in chapter 4, God starts messing with him a little bit. It says this, this, uh, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah. He became very angry. I, I, there's never been a moment where somebody gave their life to Christ, and I got really angry about it. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? You ever talk to God like that? I have, but I, I get quickly shut back down. That is why I ran away. I knew that you are merciful. I knew that you were compassionate. I knew that you were slow to get angry. I knew that you were filled with unfailing love. You were eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now. Now, when we, this is the equivalent of when people come to know Christ here and we baptize them. And then I go to my office and I get mad. I can't believe you would do this, God. I can't believe these people would be baptized and they would be, just kill me now. I don't even want this job anymore. He said, I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. You better destroy it. He's telling God what he better do. That doesn't work well, by the way. And the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? And then Jonah went out to the east side of the city. He made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord arranged for a plant, a leafy plant to grow there. 
And soon it spread its leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. He got comfortable, but God also arranged for a worm. The next morning, the dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. Don't get too comfortable. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint, wished that he would die. He said, death is certainly better than living like this. This is a man of God. This is a prophet. And then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah said. Even angry enough to die. And then the Lord said, and this is where I think we need to take hold. The Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant? Though you did nothing to put it there, it came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? You're more concerned about the plant than the people. You're more concerned about your comfort than the comfort of the people who do not know me. Hear me this morning. There's a place that you're saying no to with God. And when you say no, you are boarding the ship in the opposite direction. This morning, I want you to capture that. And I want you to, the, you can return your ticket to the boat. God will get you off. But there's some of you that are running from callings that he's placed on your life. Do you know what he's asked you to do? And, and it, you've, you've been given gifts, you've been given talents, you've been given treasure. And he's called you to do specific things with that. What are you doing with it? Some of you are running from your life instead of to your life. And God's already mapped it out. So this morning, as we, as we close this part of the message, one of the first things that we do instead of, instead of fighting it is we just put ourselves into a posture of surrender. Because that's the first step. Because the storm may be the internal battle that you're fighting inside because you've yet to say yes. And you keep putting a no where God's asking you to put a yes. And it's in surrender that you will find true peace and comfort. I promise you that. It was so easy for me to run towards the thing that I desired and I wanted. And looking back on that moment, I wouldn't change anything of what God has done. I've had way more. I mean, I could have been saving lives in a helicopter in cold water. But God gave me a different passage to proclaim the gospel so that he could save lives. And I would take that over anything in the entire world. So what is your yes this morning? I want to pray for you as we, as we sing. Just take these moments of just surrendering to God, like just asking him. Maybe you don't know. Asking him what, you're, what are you holding back from? What are you running from? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for today. Um, Lord, it's so easy for us to run from you. It's so easy for us to, to chase things that will not make us happy. We think they will, but it's following you and hearing what it is that you've called us to. You have designed us. You have made us. We are fear, fear, fearfully and wonderfully made in your design. So Jesus, I just pray in this moment that you would give us this, just give us our heart that we will surrender to you. We would surrender to your lordship and we would hear from you and repent. And our lives would be changed and we would walk out of here with a commitment to faithfully follow you in every area of our life. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus.